there, there are deeper roots, Rajni. If you go back to the six centuries before Christ, you will find the emergence of visions of universal peace. Uh, the wonderful in the prophet Isaiah, he probably wrote it about 520 years before Christ. He has this wonderful vision of when the wolf and the child will be together and the lion will eat grass and there will be peace on my holy mountain and no harm shall be done. And then you have this famous figure called the suffering servant who submits to violence but refuses violence in return. So when Christ is born 600 years later, 500 years later, and they're trying to understand him, they often go back to this earlier tradition where you see um, the seeds, you might say, of a dream of universal peace, the end to all violence. So that's already there, not a strong voice, but it's already there in the tradition. Well, you see, I think it's not just what Jesus said, it's what he did, that he, he turned the other cheek. And when they came to arrest him, his followers put up their swords and he said, put down your swords. And when somebody was attacked by one of his followers, he healed the man who'd been attacked. So he embodied nonviolence. He didn't just speak of it. And so the central symbol of Christianity, a man hanging wounded on a cross, is a man who refused to repay violence for violence. Um, and who even forgave the people who were put him on that cross, saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. So at the essence of it was, I think, a profound rejection of, of any violence. Turn the other cheek. Gandhi was of immense importance in the West. He greatly influenced people like Dorothy Day, the American pacifist, Thomas Merton, a Cistercian monk. But you also see other currents which influenced Gandhi. So I think we, we all influence each other all the time. So I think Gandhi summoned us back. His stark, uncompromising nonviolence woke up, if you want, Christianity to its earliest roots. The first 300 years, you know, Christianity was in a non-violent religion. Nobody could be a soldier for the first 300 years. Anyone who was baptized had to renounce being in the army. And Gandhi summoned us back to ourselves. And that was a, a great blessing, a great gift. All over the world, you see religion is used to, um, as a focus for identity over against other people. Whereas the great religions of the world invite us to open our identity. My identity should be inseparable from the people that I meet, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Muslim, the Jew. I should be opening my, my very being to them. Identity lies ahead. Identity isn't completely known yet, but all pilgrims on the way to knowing who we are. But nationalism gives us closed identities, aggressive identities. And religion is a very simple way of doing that. It's also part of a new fundamentalism, which is sweeping the world. Nationalistic fundamentalism, economic fundamentalism which says there's only the market. Everything is about the market. Um, the scientific fundamentalism. Ever, all consciousness is just a move, electricity in your brain. And all this feeds into religious fundamentalism, which people think is somehow medieval. It isn't medieval, it's modern. And this is the extraordinary joy, I think, of difference. Difference is fertile. Different, we know it in our, we're both due to difference ourselves, aren't we, Rachel? Yeah. Mothers and fathers. A difference produces what we could never expect. So I think I would say 
don't be afraid of difference. Don't platform anybody. Don't silence anybody. Of course, there are some views which are so horrific, like people who deny the Holocaust of the Jews in the last century. I understand that that should not be allowed to be sex. It's a complete nonsense. But, but most differences we can attend to. Yeah. On the General Council, we had one rule. Never dismiss another view as absurd. If you say, I don't agree. I think it's illogical, misinformed, yeah. but never ridiculous. Mm. I think we should not be protective of our identities. Mm. We live in a time of identity politics, gender identity, religious identity, ethnic identity. And one of the reasons for polarization are battles over identity. But none of us have finally achieved identity. Mm. Fullness of identity lies ahead. Yes. One of my favorite lines in the New Testament is, who we are is yet to be revealed. Mm. We're only travelers. Whereas if I settle down into some fixed identity which I must defend yes. against aggressors, I will never grow, I will shrivel up. I will become a small person, maybe nobody at all. We're becomings more than we're beings. Oh. We're flowing yes. water more than solid rocks. Yes. And all water finds its way down to the big open ocean and mingles. Indeed. Indeed. Like the Ganges. <laughs>